Hello and welcome to ESG, a bridge to action presented by PwC India in association with moneycontrol.com. In this particular series, we have been endeavoring to look at the transition that corporate India is seeing in terms of the ESG adoption all across. And remember that as India Inc. looks to embark on the growth journey and undertake a lot of uh, investments as well, the responsible investing and ESG driven investing is also something that is gaining momentum. And also not to forget that the regulators play a very important role in the adoption of sustainability of India Inc. as well. So let's talk about this and the future that lies in this particular space with two experts joining me on the show. Let me welcome on the show Dhanpal Zaveri of Everstone and Dinesh Arora of PwC India. Gentlemen, welcome on the show. But before we start this riveting discussion, let's get a special message on sustainability. ESG practices must become key value driver and differentiator for the organizations at large. These practices enable companies to innovate and develop new product lines or solutions which meet the expectations of the new age consumer and rethink processes so that they have a lesser environmental footprint. Changing consumer preferences are paving the way for companies to adopt ESG practices and integrate them into their day-to-day businesses. In the realm of textiles itself, consumers are slowly shifting to the brands with purpose and the ones that are recognized for sustainable and environmental friendly vision. And to achieve our vision, we have adopted the science-based targets framework for developing a roadmap. With this, we have joined the business ambition for a 1.5 degree centigrade campaign, the world's largest and fastest growing group of companies that are aligning with 1.5 degree centigrade targets by helping to halve global emissions by 2030. Now, my first question, Dinesha, how do you see the responsible investing bit picking up and what does it mean for the corporates looking at attracting investments? Thank you for asking this question, Nisha. I think in today's world, more than the corporates and more than the regulators, it is the financial investors who have taken the lead in driving the ESG and the responsible investment arena in this world. So as you are aware, there is a UN principle for responsible invested investments, and there are 4,500 funds who have signed up to it, and their number is growing. And current uh, amount of AUM for them is around $120 trillion. So they are the ones for each and every new investments. They are looking at how compliant the companies are as far as ESG is concerned. And more importantly, what are they doing to move the needle uh, even in traditional industries as far as their commitment to ESG goals is concerned. So they are setting up processes to monitor and move things forward. One thing that we have seen is huge amount of transformation and adoption of the new norm. So Dhanpal, how has Everstone, being a leading investor, really adopted this? And what is the kind of change that you have seen when you look at the ESG focus now? Nisha, first of all, thank you for having me on this uh, talk. Um, If you look at our journey, Everstone since 2006 has been focused on building a world-class alternative investments platform. And our endeavor is to be a business builder across all the asset classes in which we invest. Uh, we have take a very holistic development to building these businesses. And one of the most integral uh, pegs on which we develop this is making sure that these businesses are also sustainable. Uh, clearly, uh, as they look to uh, adhere to all kinds of universal uh, ESG criteria. We do this by very actively working with the businesses, uh, one, developing the roadmaps, making sure that there are active action plans which we implement, and then finally ensuring that we monitor and measure uh, these uh, criteria that we introduce into the businesses. The final aspect about this is making sure that they are uh, businesses which eventually lead to responsibility for not just generating profits for shareholders, but for society at large and leaving a kind of a legacy 
of responsible yes. stewardship as we eventually exit these businesses. Right. So, Dhanpal, uh, you spoke about monitoring and measuring. Now, that's a very critical part. We, we talk about ESG. Uh, is it a lip service or is it really being adopted and whether it's, it is having the required impact? That is becoming a very crucial aspect where we are learning on the job. How do you do that? Give us some examples. So the interesting aspect about this is maybe our, I'll live our own journey, right? What I call the ESG 1.0 for Everstone was really about just avoiding harm, making sure that as we invest in these businesses, these businesses were not doing any harm. But as we brought in some very high quality institutional investors, multilateral agencies such as IFC, we started to become much more organized about the way we thought about the role of ESG in investing in the businesses in which we uh, put money to work. In. And that's where we started developing our own proprietary framework and which today, as I call it, the ESG 3.0 version of Everstone, where we have a four pillar framework, framework focused on principles of governance, people, yeah. planet, and prosperity. And we mm. incorporate a lot of the global standards and frameworks which are available and adapt it to an, I would say, a local environment to make sure that not only can we, one, when we are taking an investment decision, evaluating what the current state of readiness of the business is, two, looking at if there are any gaps, and then based on those identified gaps, creating a corrective action plan and mm -hmm. making sure that the investing company, when we are taking a decision to invest, commits, signs up, and once we invest, is actually even implementing those plans to make sure that we have the right kind of reporting uh, frameworks, the measurement metrics, and finally, the outcomes which come to us as part of this whole process. So it's fairly rigorous, I must say, but it, at the yes. end of the day, it takes profit with purpose at the core and then defines yes. the outcomes for the business itself. What will you advise to the companies who are looking at attracting investments when it comes to the ESG focus. So how can companies really transform, become more attractive, and what are the financial tools that they can use? So what companies need to do is basically get ESG diligence beforehand and you know be ready to commit to investors that what are they going to be able to do over one, two, three years. So they have to show that what, how they are moving the needle. And the proof of the pudding is in eating. So if you look at some of the funds which have been raised for the purpose of making companies more ESG compliant and for the purpose of making it sustainable, the cost of financing or green bonds as we have seen, you know, their cost is 10 to 75 bips lower than normal financing for that particular company. So if you have to be ready to get quality investors, you need to invest to first study where you are. Second is to have a roadmap to present to investors like Dhanpal that how you are going to move the needle to make your profits more sustainable. And third is a regular monitoring to see how you are moving in each of these parameters to demonstrate to the investors and to the world at large that you are sustainable and people should respect you for that. Articulation of ESG is very important. Having a clear roadmap is very important, but monitoring it also to see that it has the desired impact is also very important. But Dhanpal, I want to ask you, while we have already gone on this journey, what lies, lies ahead in terms of the priorities in future in this particular space and ESG-led investing? So, Nisha, what's happening, and I think COVID has brought this out and kind of, you know, it magnified it in a big way, is that we realize that uh, accounting and economic profits that most businesses um, demonstrate today does not factor in the true cost of environment, society, uh, the planet and the people. So there is two very sharp, I would say, trends emerging from this. One is businesses who are actually proactive and are leading with making sure that, you know, they're factoring in these risks and doing business in a much more sustainable manner are seeing valuations for these businesses grow dramatically. And on the other end, businesses who continue to impact, um, whether it be the planet or people, are seeing their valuations actually erode 
because the cost of that future or that future cost is now being priced into the value of the asset today. Uh, this is being played out very sharply uh, by investors across the globe, and it's also starting to play out in India. And I do believe that is going to drive a lot of change in the way businesses report, businesses measure and manage uh, their ESG responsibilities. I, I think investors have already spoken, uh, financiers have already spoken. Uh, as uh, Rohit um, you know, mentioned, one of the key issues is around uh, pricing risk. And already we've seen businesses which are ESG forward are seeing their cost of financing come down much more sharply than businesses which have not been able to adapt. And that is driving that change. Uh, I don't believe enough has been done. I do completely agree with the fact that this change uh, from, I would say, the past to what businesses need to do going forward has a cost attached to it. And it's not being fully priced in. It's a period of change, and I do believe that there will be some pain, uh, and people will have to take some pretty hard decisions, whether they buy it now, reduce their costs and their or increase costs and reduce profits in the short term, but really changing business and thereby driving one yes. most importantly survivability of the businesses for the long term, and then eventually, uh, you know, it reflecting in the true cost for them to finance their businesses. And uh, finally, I would like to ask then, Paul, can the regulators and the government do anything to fast track this process? Uh, absolutely. We've already seen to a certain extent government regulations uh, driving this positive change. But I do believe that a lot of this can be through much more active measures to start pricing in this risk uh, in various parts, uh, whether it be in the banking system, whether it be in the insurance um, system, and finally, whether it be in the capital markets. So I do believe that finance will play a very key and an enabling role and the role of government in you know, accelerating it, in ensuring that these risks are priced in as people look yes. to uh, provide capital, you know, both for uh, positive change as well as to disincentivize right, the negative aspects of ESG. That's right. You, you, you've got the biggest point out uh, in your last few words, uh, Danpal. I have to agree uh, that the valuations of companies are getting higher as they are getting more ESG compliant and only quality companies are getting that premiumization of valuation. And that itself will drive the overall ecosystem to move towards this particular journey much faster than they probably thought. With that, uh, it's a wrap. Thank you so much, Tanpal, as well as Dinesh, for joining in with your deep insights on this very important topic as companies embark on sustainability and investors create a, a, an ecosystem for this to be fast-tracked and for the companies to adopt it in a much better way for a sustainable future and financing options. Thank you so much.